Genesis 11, and basically the, the question that was asked, Dwayne Lepke asked this question, and I'm going to touch a little bit on what uh, uh, Tara asked, uh, Tara Haney. Uh, she asked about the earth divided and land bridges and the continental drift and all that stuff. Uh, but the premise is this. If the Bible is true, of course I believe it's true, but if it is true, then science would always corroborate, would always uh, prove what the Bible says. Now remember science, true science, uh, is a observation, uh, measurement uh, of what scientists see and what they, what they observe. And so true science, I'm not talking about their interpretation of the facts, I'm talking about the facts of science. The facts of science will always match up with the scriptures. Uh, Christians don't have to check their minds when they get saved, you know, and just live in this dream world of just trusting and taking kind of like uh, uh, you heard this morning with um, that Indiana Jones thing. I think he threw something on that before. I don't remember the movie. I don't watch movies over and over, but I think that Indiana Jones threw something before he stepped, but I don't remember how he did it. But you don't have to live that way with the Bible. You can know that, that longer, as long as time goes by, scientists will more and more bump into the truths that are in the Bible. So let me show you what I mean. Here's Duane's questions. What is Genesis 11's one language? I think that's where he started. Why did God confuse that language? Was the Tower of Babel, you know, he kind of said, what was going on there? And what language he ended with will we have in heaven? And so that, that, was, uh, that was a good question, Dwayne. And so that takes us to Genesis 11. So open your Bible, because this is a record from God for us. Now, this is not everything that's possible. We already know from John 21 that if, if, or John chapter 20, that if everything that Jesus said and did was written down, the world can contain it, which speaks of who he really is. He's not just a Jewish figure that lived 33 years, but he's actually the God of the universe. And so it's incomprehensible to write down all he did and said and everything else. But either God gave his account in Genesis, or he didn't. So, as you're sitting there looking at Genesis 11, where Duane asked his question from, either what you're holding is the, the account God gave in Genesis, or he didn't give it, or it is what the German liberals, the school of interpretation that said that it was, Genesis was written by four different groups, the J, E, P, and D group. Uh, because they didn't think Moses knew how to write. And he couldn't possibly have written all that anyway. So either God gave this or not. Either the record of Genesis is true, or we don't have a true God. Because Jesus in the New Testament said to the Pharisees, don't you believe what Moses wrote? And we have entire segments of Christianity that don't believe what Moses wrote. So either the record of Genesis is true, that God told him what to write, or we don't have a true God, because the incarnate God himself believed that Moses wrote the first five books, and it was true. And either science would uncover proof of Genesis, or God is false. In other words, if not their twisted interpretation, you know, basically scientists, a lot of them say anything but God, and we say, that everything was made by God. They say God made, or I mean, anything but God made everything, and we say God made everything. And so we have a real disparity there. So let's see what true science does. So where does Genesis 11 fit? Well, it fits after Genesis 1 through 10. How do you like that? And so either it's all true or none of it's true. So what I'm going to show you this evening is that we can't pick and choose. And Genesis 11, if we just take that question, is one of the most powerful evidences that everything God says in this book is true. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, first of all, let's get the run up. Genesis 1 and 2 gives the truth. Remember, God is always going to accurately tell us, and, and God is truth, and he, there's no uh, lying. And so his account of Genesis 1 is how he wants us to understand that in the beginning, God created everything. I mean, even a little child could get the drift of Genesis 1 and 2. And it's the truth about the days of creation that God witnessed, and he tells us what he did. That's how the whole book is written. And if you 
if you go to Sunday school, you know in day one, in Genesis 1, it says that God created light and separated the light from the darkness. And he saw that it was good, and that was the first day. Whoop, back up. We don't want to miss any days. And then the second day, he separated the, the sky and the sea, the firmament above from the firmament beneath, and we all know that. And on day three, the land. He formed the dry land and all of the, the plants and... Um, come on. Stop. Oh, my shirt is getting on there. Come on. There we go. We don't want to add to creation. Uh, but God made the dry land, uh, separated the land from the water. He made the plants and the trees on day three. Now, see, the problem with theistic evolution is that they overlay the creation account with evolutionary thought, which is the fact that, that a day is like 10,000 years or a million years or a billion years. So the first problem with the theistic evolutionary thought is, which, which is held by a vast majority of the prominent, well-known Christian schools around the country that are trying to accommodate, they're trying, like you heard this morning, uh, they want, remember in one of the messages, Michael Brown was saying that they have their foot on both places and they're kind of trying to straddle. If you straddle theistic evolution with the Bible, how did the plants and trees survive for millions and billions of years with no light from the sun? Now there was light in the universe, but there was no light as we know it coming onto the earth in day three, other than the general light of God, you know, lighting where he was. Because on day four, God made the sun. In fact, look in Genesis. This is my, one of my favorite awesome verses in the Bible. Uh, if you read in Genesis chapter 1, and uh, he says, uh, da, 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 verse 16, then God made two great lights. Here they are, you know, the sun and the moon. God made two great lights. Um, the greater light to rule the day, the sun. The lesser light to rule the night, that's the moon. Now look at the next part, the ending of verse 16 because there's this little smudge over here. He made the stars also. There's an incomprehensible number of stars in magnitude and variety in every aspect. All stages from collapsing, dying, to exploding, everything. And look at the only, that was such a non-event for God, it's just included as almost a, an appendage. He made the stars too. And that's one of the most awesome events when we think astronomically of the world. But that's on day four. So, the, so added to uh, light and the sky and the sea and the dry land and the plants come the sun, moon, and stars on day four. And day five, the only witness of creation tells us what happened. It says that he made all the, the teeming fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And it wasn't until day six that he made at the same time on the same creative day, all of the animals to add to all this else. And then, of course, he made Adam and Eve. And then he rested the seventh day. Which, by the way, uh, that concept of rest, not the cessation of life, but the concept of rest is going to be very interesting when we get to it in Genesis 58. I mean, uh, Isaiah 58. It's right after the, the whole fasting thing. Is God talking about that and the need for rest. But that's in the morning service. But Genesis 3 and 4 continues and explains the truth about how mankind fell into sin, and then all the universe fell under the curse of sin. That's what Romans 8 says. It says all of the universe is groaning, uh, waiting the redemption. So that's the truth about uh, how we got into the predicament, the, the horrific infection of sin, the SIN virus. Then Genesis 6 through 8 explains the truth about how the entire earth was destroyed by water through a cataclysmic global flood that was survived by Noah and the occupants of the ark. So that means that if the water was 100 uh, feet above uh, anything that was on the earth, you know, even above the mountaintops, that means that there would be no structure, no human habitation, no anything that any humans built from before the flood. Because the earth before the flood was completely destroyed by water. And if, if you've ever seen any, any news reports on flooding or tsunamis or anything else, 
imagine combining volcanism, the, the fountains of the deep, the volcanoes coming up. We know one of the volcanoes from the flood. It's the one at, at Yellowstone, and it covered the continental United States, about 40% of it. That was one volcanic eruption from the cauldron of Yellowstone during the time of the flood. And so, I mean, unbelievable devastation. And so everything that we see on Earth right now, all of the plants, all of the animals, and all of the humans are from after the flood. So that's another reason why we're all related. Not only are we all descendants from Adam, but all of us are descended from Noah and through one of his three sons. So we're all cousins, everybody. Everybody in this room, you're cousins uh, because you are the descendants of the three sons of Noah. And so am I. And so this, this is, uh, each of these has to be true for chapter 11 to be true because the same God wrote it all, witnessed it all, and tells us everything about it. But keeping on now to where we're getting, Genesis 11 is actually a part of a package. It's Genesis 9, 10, and 11. It explains the truth about how the entire earth was settled by the descendants of the three sons of Noah after mankind's language was confounded by God at Babel. Now, how do you pronounce that? Well, did you know the dictionaries have two different pronunciations? It's either B-A-H-B-E-L or B-A-Y-B-E-L. So it's either Babel or Babel. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it, but it does matter whether you believe it. So let's look at what happened because um, Genesis 10, by the way, if, if you go back from chapter 11, it's very fascinating that God tells us um, the genealogies of all these descendants of Noah in chapter 10, and here they all are, there were three sons of, of Noah, uh, Japheth, uh, Shem, and Ham. And they each have these, these incredible listings of who their descendants are. And you say, does that even matter? It's really interesting. If the flood is when God said it was, how long ago was it? What are the oldest living creatures, uh, substances. What, what's the oldest life on earth right now? Well, there are two groups. They're, they're basically plants, trees, actually. The sequoias are 3,500, 4,000 years old, some of them. The bristle cone pines, the, that's the oldest current living thing, are about 4,000 some years old. Some of them, they say, are 4,600 years old. That would mean that that's pretty close to, I mean, our reckoning of the time of the flood. Science has proved that there's nothing alive on earth that was alive before the flood. That's an observation they've made that's a fact that exactly agrees with the scripture. But also, every nation on earth is somehow today tied to these family groupings that you can see here. You know, the Ham family is right uh, goes all the way down to there, and the Shem family goes all the way to there, and the Japheth family. And it's fascinating uh, if you study history. Uh, in fact, uh, one interesting, this is an early Irish genealogy. Uh, they, all of these, uh, you know, the, the Irish clans and everything, if you look at them, they actually say that they come through Magog and down and actually come down this way. This is not biblical. This early Irish genealogy is actually, if you go to the Royal Archives in Ireland, you'll find the biblical names. Uh, uh, well, some of the biblical names. These aren't in the Bible. These are from modern history, post-Mosaic. But it's interesting. You can do this. In fact, there's a, a, a book called... Um, it's by uh, Bill Cooper. It's on Amazon. It's really interesting. Um, those of you with your phones can even look it up. And it's about, uh, it's something about the table of nations and uh, what happened after Genesis 10. And he actually spent, this guy spent his entire career, 30 years, uh, grousing around the royal archives of all the European nations. And he said there is not one disagreement with the biblical table of nations. So that's, that's a fascinating study, but it's not what we're doing tonight. So basically, 
The record of Genesis is this. The more we look, the more we see everything in Genesis is reflected in all the scientific observations and facts on earth. Now, we're just going to look at Genesis 11 tonight. But believers agree with all the facts of science, just not the interpretations of those who don't want a true creator God, which is so interesting. See, all of us have a bias, and, and we interpret the facts through our grit, through our bias, through our predetermined way that thing, our world view is actually what we've seen over the last few weeks. So the record of Genesis, everything in Genesis is reflected in the world around us. As long as you don't interpret it away, like Romans 1 says, because they did not want to retain God in their minds. They, there's a whole group of people that don't want to retain God. They don't want this judge. They don't want this creator. They don't want the responsibility. They don't want to have a judgment. So, back to Dwayne's question, okay? It was question two. What is Genesis 11, one language? Well, let's look that up. It's the one God spoke to Adam in, and the one that God spoke to Cain in, and that Cain talked to Abel in. It's that same language. So look at Genesis 2, and we'll see what the language is. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying... And God spoke in a language to Adam in Genesis 2, 16. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree, verse 17, of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. And so right there, there's a language, and God is talking in it, and Adam is hearing it, and he is understanding it. Now look at chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It's the same language the Lord said to Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. By the way, that's the first occurrence of the word sin in the Bible. It's very interesting. And its desire is for you, that you but you should rule over it. So sin is, is a force. It's a... It's a uh, this, it's just, it's a very hard to describe thing, but it's, it's powerful. It's almost like a virus. Sin is like virus. In fact, our whole electronic world is showing us so much about the spiritual world. A virus is not really alive, but it attaches itself and, and causes havoc by its attachment. Sin is, is a powerful attachment that corrupts and, and brings under bondage, and, and its desire is for us, but we should rule over it and say no. And, and so, same language. Now look at verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel. The same, whatever this language is, God communicates to Adam and to Cain and others and Abraham, etc., etc. And they communicate with each other. Verse 8. Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Now think about what you're reading in Genesis 4 and verse 8. You're reading an actual record of an event at the beginning of history. And you're actually reading it, and it's, it's absolutely accurate. Uh, what's amazing is that the Bible is accurate, and all the other records have been kind of uh, altered a little bit. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton, still thought to be one of the greatest scientists of all time, you know, you know, the apple falling on him and gravity and all that stuff. But Isaac Newton was a lifelong scholar of the scriptures. And in his spare time, when he wasn't being Mr. Famous British Scientist, he read all the classics. I mean, every classical piece of literature from all the way back to the earliest Greek writings, everything. He was just a master. He just was kind of like a computer. And you know what he said? He found out that all of those ancient civilizations exaggerated their rules of the kings and they exaggerated their accomplishments and everything. And he said, what's so interesting is in the ancient Greek records, in the ancient Egyptian, the ancient Assyrian, and the ancient everything records, he said, if you just kind of let the air out of them, they all calibrate with the Bible. And he spent his hobby, Isaac Newton's hobby, was writing a history of the world. And he, it was published, actually, two years after he died. But basically, uh, what, what he saw is that all of this is true, that it's recent. He really was a firm, he was a, a 
in agreement with Bishop Usher's chronology within a few years, that the Earth uh, creation was about 4,000 BC, which would get you laughed out of Western, K College, KVCC, and most Christian colleges today. But the greatest scientist in history, Isaac Newton, spent his entire lifetime tracking down all classical literature. He read it all himself. You should see his calculations and everything else. And he said, if you just take the fog out of those, they all agree. I usually say, just take all the zeros off. And most of, you know, scientific, like, go to the national parks. And if you take all the zeros off, the extra zeros, it's probably just about right. But let's go back. What was Genesis uh, 11's one language? Well, think about language today. And again, I'm going to use uh, unbelievers here. Think of this. Apes around the world can understand each other. So why do intellectually superior humans have around 7,000 distinct languages? Now, I didn't write that. That was queried by evolutionary biologist Mark Pagel. He's from Britain. Look what he says. Pagel, a professor at the University of Reading in the UK, heads a team searching for an evolutionary explanation for our many languages. And you can read his findings uh, online. Here's what he asks. Why, he asks, would humans evolve a system of communication that prevents them with communicating with other members of the same species? Why does he say that? Well, Pagel writes, you can take a gorilla or a chimpanzee from its troop, plop it down anywhere these species are found, and it would know how to communicate. You could repeat this with donkeys, crickets, or goldfish and get the same outcome. Did you ever think of that? Birds from anywhere in the world of the same species are, are all, watch them. You can import them and they'll fly and sink. They communicate. Fish, animals, it uh, doesn't matter if a deer is from, you know, here or Texas. If they snort, they understand and they, they knew what's going on. But you put humans from two different, you know, they look at each other, they can't understand them. Have you ever wondered why the most highly evolved, to use their terms, species of animal, humans, have 7,000 distinct languages? Well, if you believe the Bible, you know exactly why. Because God confused the language. See, that's why. But why did God confuse the language? We know the result is we have 7,000, or actually 6,000, something. I, they're always going up the more they discover different languages. But why do we have these 7,000 languages? Because God confused the language. Why did God confuse the language? Because mankind refused to obey God, spread out, filled the earth, and instead started building a structure. Now let's get to chapter 11. It's just a fascinating study, what's going on here. In Genesis 11, the whole earth had one language and one speech. So God made all species able to communicate with each other, from goldfish to humans. And all human beings, all made in his image, all were able to, to communicate at the highest levels because they were doing things that we can't understand how they do. Did you know to this day, we don't know how early civilizations, right after the flood, were able to construct some of the things that are constructed. Just one rock up at, at Baalbek in Lebanon, I mean in the Hezbollah camp. There's a temple to Zeus up there that was built by the Romans. And there is not a hydraulic mechanical machine on earth today that can move those rocks. Yet they're, they're beautifully in the temple of Baalbek. They're, they're up there. And we don't know how they did that. I mean, how did they get Stonehenge so perfectly lined up? I was taking a group into a tomb in Egypt once. Bonnie and I were. Uh, I wouldn't suggest it now, but uh, we rode a houseboat down the Nile. It was fun back in the old days. We're really old when, when it wasn't dangerous. And, and we were down there, and I was, I was lecturing and teaching about Moses and everything. And all of a sudden, we got into one tomb, and all these people were laying in the sarcophagus, and they were humming, and they were hugging all these Egyptian stones. And what it was is, that was the day, one day a year, when the sun at a certain point uh, when it rose would shine a shaft of light right into the center of that tomb. 
And there in the middle of Luxor, in the middle of the desert, those engineers engineered this incredible, I mean, they had calculated and knew exactly how to get the sun to shine on that sarcophagus once a year. And all these new age people were trying to get the vibes from the God of nature or something. There is still knowledge we don't understand that's, that's part of this incredible overflow of when all of humanity, right after creation, was so endowed by God with so much knowledge. So they had one language. And it came to pass, verse 2, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. What journeyed from the east? What are we journeying from the east? They're coming down from the region around Mount Ararat. You see, the, the Bible is explaining that God created everyone, uh, I mean, created Adam and Eve and their descendants, and then he took from that Noah and his family, put them on the ark, and the ark settled on Mount Ararat. Part of the flood was the upthrust, the continental, the tectonic, the moving of the plates, and all the, the earthquakes, and everything settled out so that it looks like it looks now on the, on the globe. And then the flood was slowly the waters receded and the ark landed on Mount Ararat. And so then humans began living in that area and so they start moving downward. In fact, they move downward. Um, well, is this a real event? And, uh, but let me show you. Oh, I'm gonna get to my map, but I forgot this. There's two scientific facts. Remember I told you that the Bible would agree or science would agree with the Bible? It's amazing that just like God says in Genesis, there are structures like the one we're going to talk about in this event on nearly every continent. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the similarities between the Cahuica Mounds, you know, down in, on the way to St. Louis in, in, uh, in southern Illinois, those things with the Aztec, the Inca, and the Mayan, Machu Picchu in South America, the Egyptian. Have you ever thought of the amazing similarities, the Nubian uh, incredible pyramids. There is a structure that's at the Tower of Babel. The tower doesn't mean leaning tower of pizza. It, it was a stepped structure. The word actually means this stepped structure, a ziggurat. And these structures are amazingly similar on every continent, nearly every continent. That, and of course, we haven't covered every moved every bit of dirt everywhere to find them. And that there are so many languages, almost 7,000 that can't be traced. Why would that be? Well, because, oh, and I, I clipped this out of the Wall Street Journal too, the mother of all languages. The world's 6,000, that was in 2011, see? They didn't know we're up to almost 7,000. But the world's 6,000 or so modern languages may have all descended from a single ancestral tongue spoken by now, see, they get it all mixed up. Just knock off some zeros. Uh, between about 5,000 and 7,000 years ago. See, just, just lower, take some zeros off. Tower of Babel was actually about 4,000 years ago. 40-some hundred years ago. The findings published Thursday in the Journal of Science, and I'll show you some of those. It, it talks about this fact that there seems to be this overspread uh, of course, Dr. Leakey localized it down here. You remember Dr. Leakey? You know, in the National Geographic, he would find a tooth and construct this amazing looking person out of a tooth. <laughs> no, honestly, I used to read the National Geographic and you'd look at this entire thing and you'd find one bone fragment that he had constructed an entire body out of, but it doesn't matter. Uh, people were paying him and he was excavating down here in the Ulduvai Gorge in uh, Africa. Actually, everybody spread out from up here. And so, you know, uh, how long ago do you say it was? 3.6, so he was just off a little bit, Dr. Leakey was, because they came out of Mount Ararat and they started spreading out and went down to the furthest reaches. Look at this, this is now Tara uh, Haney's question. How did they do that? After the flood, during the ice age, there were land bridges. You could get to every continent because of that or take little boat trips to, uh, uh, you know, to get down to Australia if, if you missed the land bridge. But basically, they have seen human 
habitation or occupation, or they call it migration, came outward from a central place. They're off a little bit. They say it was in Africa. We say we know where it was because God witnessed it and they didn't. But it, it, it really, if you look at this, and especially if you look at this, this is out of a Sunday school book, The Tower of Babel. But if you look in every civilization around the world, I mean, you recognize the pyramids, but and, and all these Mayan, Aztec, Inca, the ones that are in, in Mexico, there is a similarity between all of them that emanates from this event and also in their histories. If you look in the ancient histories of the civilizations of the world, most of them have some type of a flood account. Now it's kind of screwed up and not according to the Bible, but they exaggerate and fluff and put their characters in it and everything else. Even the Chinese language has an ark with eight people in it. I mean, the ancient capturing of that. And all of these records of ancient civilizations talk about this structure and languages being confused. And it's fascinating, these vestigial, these little things in, uh, in history. Now, this is what's fascinating that evolutionists can't figure out. The patchwork of languages. These different colors are different language groups. And what they found out is of the 7,000, about 7,000 languages, so far, up through the last few uh, months, they have found all 7,000 of them reduced down to 94 distinct branches on the tree of languages, the, the ethnological language trees. And, and I have a picture of one in here, and they're really interesting to look at. But what they can't figure out is, why, why did this, you know, the Chinese group in Tibetan, they call it the Tibetan, why did they all stay there? And why did these stay up here? Uh, this is a real unique group up here. It's, it's related to little touches around other parts of the world, but it's very unique and only over here in this part of the Scandinavian and the top up here. Why are they like that? And why is this black one, you know, thrown all over the place and the purple one there, but the green, this Indo-European, they call it P-I-E, Proto-Indo-European language. Why is that one so spread out and intermixed? And, and basically, secular theories fail to explain the many distinct language families throughout the world, but the biblical account at the Tower of Babel explains. And every, all the data they're finding fits with what the Bible says. Here's the, this is just one example. I mean, if, if uh, you are studying ethnology and linguistics, you'll see the old world language families. Here's the PIE, the Proto-Indo-European, and it goes into the Indo and into the European, and in the Indo, it gets into the Indic, and it goes up, you know, Bengali, Hindi, Punjabi, Persian, and the Iranian is one separate little branch, and all together, and, and here's, they basically say there's two basic big parts, the Uralic languages, which are the Scandinavian and these Inuits and all the, or whatever, the top of Russia, those, uh, uh, people that live up there in the Arctic region. Those two are the Uralic and then the Proto-Indo-European as everybody else. And what's amazing is that they look at this and they can only reduce the 7,000 down to 94 branches. All these branches all over here. Did you know if they keep working, they will probably get to the 70 that are in Genesis 10. Because God already told us that there were 70 family groups that he dispersed to the ends of the earth. So they're getting closer. They're not quite there yet, but they're getting closer with understanding what the scriptures say, that God said that he sent them out. Where did he send them out? Uh, this is the possible location uh, of Babel, right here, between the Tigris and uh, the Euphrates in the plain of Shinar, uh, south east of, you know, up here, uh, 
up there would have been higher off the screen would have been Mount Ararat and they migrated to the east and liked this flat plain. Now see some people say that the tower they were building was to escape the flood. They didn't want to go in a flood again. If you didn't want to escape a flood you would not have gone in flat ground between two rivers. You know what I mean? You would have stayed on Mount Ararat. So uh, they, they actually were not building the Tower of Babel to escape a flood. They were building it as a rebellion against God, which goes back to, that's where we were in the text. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found that where they are, the plain of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, I'm in Genesis 11:3. let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Asphalt, asphalt. What, every time they poke a pipe in the ground over there in the plain of Shinar, what do they find? Oil. Yeah, I mean, this is over there in that spot. And they, they get this asphalt <coughs> and uh, use it. They're sticking it together with this black um, substance. Uh, and they said, come, let us build ourselves, verse 4, a city and a tower whose top is, to the heaven, is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, what was it that, that God said? be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God wanted humanity to overspread the whole earth and to be fruitful and multiply. And by the way, he created, God created into plants the most incredible, explosive life. Did you know one sunflower, next time you see a sunflower, if you cut the head off that sunflower and planted every seed and harvested in seven successive years, you could overspread the whole earth with just one sunflower's product. Do the math sometime of multiply exponentially what God has done just in a sunflower. Now imagine if every egg that every fish lays, if all of them in one season survived and didn't get eaten by all the other you know, predators, and every one of them had, you would fill the ocean after just about 10 years with one exponential growth. The, the way God made the explosive power of life on earth, there was going to be enough food for everybody if they filled the earth. Of course, there's enough food right now. If it wasn't for greed and some uh, religious, did you know the cows eat more grain in India than you know, almost than we use in America. I mean, if there weren't some of these strange ideas, there is enough food for everybody in the whole earth, but it's greed and not agreeing with God. But I'm, I'm not on Duane's question. Come on, let's go. We'll be scattered abroad, verse four, over the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city. Verse five, and the tower they built, and the Lord said, indeed, this people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and let, and, and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building. It doesn't say he destroyed the tower. In fact, some of the stuff that they dig up over there, uh, they found a huge base of, uh, of some structure over in, in the Shinar area. It, there might still be some of this uh, around because the, uh, the flood didn't destroy it. But the Lord scattered them, verse eight, over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And then this list, and, and look at the list, the genealogies in verse 10 but look at the, the actual wider genealogy of chapter 10, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Noah. And here are the 70 nations that, that are the ones that are at Babel, the ones that are spread over all the earth. It's just fascinating to read. So um, basically, now again, this is, this is vintage National Geographic, and I mean as in 2015 vintage. And this is their human migration right here. 
This is how the National Geographic says that people got to where they are. And they're plotting, you know, there's Monte Verde 14,600 years ago, and Clovis, New Mexico, and Meadowcroft, I don't know where that is, New York or something, Spirit Cave, Kennewick, Yana River up there uh, with the Inuit people, and Minnetogawa. I mean, oh, there's something in China. Uh, but look where they're spreading out from. They say that they came from the Ulduvai Gorge, but actually they came from Mount Ararat, and the descendants of Japheth went vroom. They were eager beavers. And <laughs> Ham went down, and Shem went here and combined with Japhethites and went to the furthest, to the island people and everything. And what's so amazing is human migration, they're just off by about 15, 1800 miles and several zeros, but exactly, but as they went out, what they did is all of these groups stayed within uh, and, and if I could go back to that other map that showed the language groups, once they, I mean, think about, once they got confused, uh, you know, the, the Japhethites uh, that, that took the northern route, this family group stayed here with this language. This family group kept going, and they stayed there with this language. Uh, this this uh, Hamitic group stayed down here, but they were overrun by some Japhethites that either sailed around and landed with this language group, or, you know, there's little green specks went down. But there was not like the Japhethites couldn't go here and there, but each language group from the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, each of them kept a distinct language that didn't commingle with the others just like all of these river people along the Amazon. And, uh, but yet there are these unusual language groups that like right down here in Guatemala, there's one and right up there and on the coast there, uh, that is near where one of our missionaries is, right there in South Brazil uh, and where the Logan's kids were. There's a distinct language group from Central Asia that's down there. And even this family, and see what it says in Genesis 11? It says, therefore, uh, verse 8, the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the earth. Verse 9, and the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And all of that spread out from Mount Ararat and from the plain of Shinar and went to every corner of the earth. And they went on that land bridge and came in here and settled and went all the way down here. And all these, these 94 language groups are actually the 70 from the table of nations, from the family of nations that, that went. Okay, so let's keep going or we'll never get finished tonight because it's 7.04. So whenever you see pyramids, whether it's the, the, the ones in America, the ones in Central America, the ones in South America, the ones that, that are in the Middle East, that are in Africa, uh, even Angkor Wat, although that's only 900 years old. This whole idea, this tower, which all of these, that's really a blurry picture of the pyramids, but these things are engineered astrologically. They're tied to the stars. And there's such a high degree of even, even the sun coming in uh, at the, the different solstice and equinox and everything else, they're exactly scientifically engineered with a astrological. That means that, that there is this worship of the sun and the moon and the stars, that all of these, like the Mayans, the, the Aztecs, that, that we're trying to appease the sun or the sun god instead of the true god. See, what, what happened is at the Tower of Babel, they were trying to have, if you notice, said they want a name. They want to make a name for themselves. Uh, let's see, let, and make verse 4. Let's make a name for ourselves. They didn't want the name of God. They wanted to make their own. They wanted their own worshiping themselves, which is so interesting. God spread everybody throughout the earth until now, when the world is united, we are finally united in communication, finally. 
I mean, I get posts on Facebook from all different languages, and you just hit the translate button. Trans, now it's a little choppy. But we finally have overcome basically in communication babel. Now, not culturally. People don't take Google with them to the, you know, where they live, and so there's still ethnic rivalries and distinctions and, and, and all kinds of tensions. But communication-wise, the whole world doesn't miss anything anymore. And that has set the stage for, uh, indeed, the people, verse 6, are one. They have one language in what they begin to do, and nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. The Lord was withholding the unification of the languages until the end of days when the Antichrist is going to be able to communicate with the whole world. So when you see the pyramids, think of, of the fact of this overspreading. So back to where we were. If, if we have a question and we go to the Bible to answer the question, we go to the record of Genesis, either God gave his account, either God is the authority of how we got here, our origin, either God is the authority of our purpose, why we're supposed to live every day, and of our destiny, or he isn't. Either he spoke in Genesis and you can trust it, or you, you can't. And if you can't believe the record of Genesis is true, then we don't have a true God. Because when God came to walk on earth, Jesus believed the Old Testament in its entirety. He called all 39 books, 22 in Hebrew, he called those the scriptures. And he said they can't be broken. There's no error. There's no uh, part of them that can be overthrown. They can't be controverted. They, they are reliable. Either science would uncover proof of Genesis or God is false. So scientifically, they're finding that there's not one common, even though the Wall Street Journal said they were getting close, scientists have still not been able to find why the 7,000 languages exploded among one species from 94 little units. But we know why. And science has verified God himself confused in one instant all of the families of the earth. So, the record of Genesis tells us that, and it's verified by the fact that just like God says in Genesis 11 and 9 and, and 10, there are structures like the one at Babel. These stepped pyramidic structures are everywhere. And also this, this whole astrological connection. All the ancient religions have this worship of the stars rather than of the creator. They worship uh, the creature more than the creator. So the structures and the so many languages. So what that tells us is you can trust the Bible. And we only have six minutes left. So let's see. Dwayne, I saw you here. Do you have a follow-up on that? Oh, what language will they speak in heaven? We didn't get to that. You still want to know that? That with one heart and one voice and one language, yes. Uh, it is interesting. Now, I don't go this far, but some people think that it could be that Hebrew, Hebrew doesn't usually show up on, any, on these ethnological charts until later days. Uh, but it's interesting that it's, it's very possible. In fact, when I was in seminary, they said we're all going to speak Hebrew in heaven, uh, which is probably true. But what language are we speaking in heaven? The same language that God spoke to Adam and Eve. See, God has, has chosen, and, and he hasn't told us what it is, but he's communicated to us, uh, to Adam and Eve, and to Enoch, and to Noah, and all the way through, and he talked to Abraham, and he's going to communicate with us in heaven. And what's interesting is, in heaven, we're all back to speaking one language, and so that we, with one heart and one voice, can magnify God. So he repairs the disunity, the confusion that, that he instituted. In heaven, we'll only have one language. Because if you notice, when you get to Revelation 4, everyone is chanting the same words. And it's the same words that the cherubim are saying. And so God corrects all of our language problems in heaven. And he unites us there around the throne. But here on earth, until computers, we didn't have united languages. But, Duane, I'm so glad you asked such a complicated question. But you have a follow-up. Yes? Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 9. Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 9. Zephaniah, 
Zephaniah, Haggai, chapter 3, verse, you said 9? For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Yeah, that's in the millennium. Yeah, in the millennium. Yep. It, in any of you, he said Zephaniah 3, 9. Uh, well, we do have four minutes. Okay. And by the way, Pastor Brown went way over in second service. <laughs> I always feel bad until he was just plowing along. And I thought, wow, I can do that too. But... Um, <laughs> Just a thought for you to think about in, in the last four minutes, and it's this. What Duane just said in Zephaniah 3.9 is a reminder that God has a future plan to rule the earth. And it's talked about in 20% of the Old Testament's prophecies are about this future time. And therefore, it's really dangerous to do this, to, to get rid of those future words. God says he has a future plan for Israel. That's who Zephaniah is talking to. He's saying, Israel, in the future, I'm going to have a pure language. When is that? That is when in Ezekiel, that huge book of Ezekiel, chapter 40 to 48, God has Israel rebuild a temple in Jerusalem for the whole world to come to. And what we have a danger for today is that in the Old Testament, God chose a group of people to reveal himself to named Israel, and there's a group of theologians that beginning in the fourth century, Augustine said Israel has become the church. And circumcision in the Old Testament has become baptism. And here's another one, watch out. The Sabbath day, which was given as a sign to Israel, has become, guess what? Sunday. And let me tell you something. Sunday is not the Sabbath day. Baptism is not the covenant sign of circumcision to the Jews. And Israel is not the church. God distinctly separates those two. And the people that believe this, the church has replaced Israel, baptism has become the new, that's why you circumcise a child at eight days, infant baptism. Uh, you were automatically, if you were an Israelite, you were the covenant people, so, and your parents could circumcise you, so, Parents baptize kids, and you've got to observe all these rules, and so you have to do all those on Sunday. But those people that believe that don't believe God has a future plan for Israel because they have replaced Israel with the church. So they do not believe this is future. And they don't believe this, that Duane said is future, 